Hey, Tidy Biology fans. My name is Matt Hershey. Still with us? Awesome. Welcome to class three. In the last class, we talked about the package Deplier, the verbs that Deplier uses, and how to manipulate our data and start gaining insight into it. In today's class, we'll be focusing on data visualization. We'll learn the package ggplot, we'll learn about the grammar of graphics, and how to make simple but effective visualizations. Time to visualize. Today is a lecture um, by Dr. Allie Mills. She will be um, uh, telling us about ggplot. So ggplot is one of the packages within the uh, tidyverse um, sort of ecosystem that is uh, arguably the reason that people use the tidyverse. So the ability to take data and to turn it into a visualization in a couple of lines of code is an incredibly powerful thing. And that's what we're going to be going over today. Um, and uh, I guess without further ado, Al, the floor is yours. OK, so for those of you who have any experience with ggplot, this is going to be a very basic introduction. Um, so bear with me. Um, <clears throat> so as Matt said, ggplot is this amazingly powerful um, graphing package within the tidyverse. And just to give you an idea of what it can do, um, <coughs> You can make graphics like this, where your data transforms. You can even make these sorts of infographics you often see in the news. Um, and this is specifically how the BBC <coughs> makes its um, infographics. They said the reason they use ggplot is because you have a huge number of graphics available to you. It saves time and effort because you can remake the same things. And you can copy and paste, like we've said before. And you can update it regularly, and it's highly reproducible. They've, um, they use ggplot so much, they've even made their own package called bbplot, which covers all the BBC themes. So if you really like BBC themes, you can download that. Um, so graphing is really important because simple graphs, um, as this quote says, the simple graph has brought more information to the data analyst mind than any other device. That's because... As humans, we really react to a visual representation of data much more than we do to a table or a list. So we can really get our point across easily and quickly using graphics. So to start off, um, I don't know if all of you have the ggplot lecture RMD open. This is going to be kind of a code along. So if you don't have that open, go ahead and open it. And for the first. Um, Exercise, we're going to use the chromosome data set that we've used before. So in your um, code along RMD, you'll have, you need to load the packages, but you also, or load the libraries, and you also need to load um, the chromosome data set as well as um, another data set that's included in there. So as I said, we'll start out with this chromosome data set. And here again is what our data set looks like. As a reminder, we have base pairs, variations, protein coding genes, information like that. So I want to start out by asking a simple question. What relationship do we expect to see between chromosome size and the number of protein coding genes? You can actually answer this. <laughs> Anyone? It's not difficult. It's not a trick question. OK, so you expect to see more protein coding genes for the longer chromosomes. Yes, OK. So um, for our first exercise, you should have this chunk of code already written in your, um, in your file. And I just want you to run it, just to see what it looks like. So this should look similar to something you made on day one. <clears throat> OK, so if you ran that chunk of code successfully, you should get a plot that looks like this, right? So a very simple plot where you can see we've mapped um, the length in millimeters on the x-axis versus protein coding genes. And we can see a trend, as we might have expected, um, that the longer the chromosome, the more protein coding genes there are. That's not necessary, necessarily a perfect trend, but um, it sticks with it. So what did we do with this piece of code? So um, what we did is we took um, data, and 
here is a nice little definition that I stole from Matt, um, where a statistical graphic is a mapping of data variables to an aesthetic attributes of a geometric object. So here we've taken the data chromosome, and we've mapped it to the geometric object, which is a scatter plot in this, um, in this example. And we've mapped um, the length in millimeters and the protein coding genes. So this code is made up of two primary chunks. The first is the chunk in which we initialize our plot using the ggplot function. So here is where you're going to assign your data. After that, there is a plus sign. So does anybody have any idea what the plus sign is and how it might relate to something you've seen before? Yes, it is ggplot's version of a pipe. So you want to add the plus sign because then you will get the and then you're going to add this next layer. So the second part of this code is the layer, which is the geometric function. So in this point case, it's g on point. So g on point is a scatter plot, and there are lots of different types of geoms, which we'll go over in a moment. Um, and in that layer, you map your aesthetics. So in this point, it's x and y. So one stylistic rule that we've kind of talked a little bit about is like pipes, you probably want to keep your plus sign at the end of your line. This is um, for, you know, just stylistic reasons. You can put it at the beginning of your geom point, but it, most code you will see will put it at the end of your line. If it's okay, I'll interject just for a moment mm -hmm. here. So um, I want to highlight the plus sign here and the pipe are not interchangeable. Mm -hmm. to answer your question. So the pipe is used to string functions together. ggplot is a function, and inside of that function, we have a lot of different aesthetics and mappings and all of the things that Ali's going to go over. So um, some people have asked sort of in our community, well, why didn't ggplot use a pipe, and why did the operator, and why did they use the plus sign here? Um, and part of it's historical reasons, and who knows, in future versions of ggplot, there, you might see a pipe, but for now, these are, uh, it's important enough for me to, to interrupt, to, to interject here, that these are not interchangeable. The plus is something that is unique to ggplot, and you can think of ggplot as a function, and all of these things are within your, uh, your, your plotting function, and we use the plus to separate them. The good thing is, if you put a pipe instead of a plus, it's one of the few, for me, helpful error messages in R. It'll actually say, did you mean a plus? Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> so just to hammer this home again, our setup is we include the data in the ggplot function where we initialize the ggplot function. And then we add a layer in which we tell it the kind of layer we want to add, the aesthetics we want to map, and the information about those aesthetics. Um, does anybody have any idea what would happen if you plotted the ggplot function without a layer? Any ideas? What's that? Exactly. You're going to get a blank square because ggplot knows the data you want it to plot, but it doesn't know how you want to plot it. So that's a good clue if you write ggplot chromosome and you get just an empty um, Black, you'll know you'd need something more. So this is the basic outline of information you can change. So you can change your data, your geometric function, and your mappings. And I want to point out one more thing. Um, I've shown you this um, code so far where data equals, and then the name of your data, and mapping equals, and then your aesthetics mapping. But you actually don't need that information. ggplot knows that you're going to give it your data first. And if you put aesthetics, it knows that the mappings are going to be within that. So you're often going to see code written like this, not like this. Um, so just be aware that you don't have to write data equals or mapping equals. So let's go into these mappings and what we can add to them. So the first thing we can change is our geoms. So Take a look at these two plots I have before you, and can anyone tell me what's similar about these plots? It's the same data. Anything else? Yeah. 
So for this case, it's not only the same data, but it's the same x variable and the same y variable. So what's, um, and as you said, the same data. So what's different about these plots? I've highlighted the answer for you. <laughs> it's the type of plot. So it's the geometric um, function that we're using here. So here we have a geom point, which is a scatter plot, and a geom smooth, which is um, more of a model, and you can create trend lines and things like that with this. So, um, so the geometric object is how we're going to represent our data. So um, how do you know which geometric function to use? There are a number of sources, resources available to you. So um, if you're in our Studio Cloud and you look to the side, you'll see your little cheat sheets here. And you can go to the ggplot2 cheat sheet, and it will look something like this. And it has this lovely layout of different types of geometric functions. And it even tells you what variables, one variable, two variable, three variables. And um, alongside that, you can also use datativiz.com. They have this lovely little um, interactive flow chart where you can choose your data types and you can look at whether or not you want one numeric variable, two, and so on, and follow these trees down to find out what kind of plots would work with your data. And these are interactive. You can scroll over them. It will tell you information about these plots. Okay. So for the second exercise, what I want you to do is change this plot, which is a geom point, into a geom box plot. Use your resources, Google it, or just try things. Um, for the most part, these plots have relatively intuitive names. So go ahead and give that a try. And uh, just a note about box plot is these extra points here are outliers. It automatically plots the outliers. So if you ever come across a GM function that you don't understand, you can um, search for the help for the GM function just like you can any other function in R. You can also just go to that um, little help space in the bottom right hand corner of your R console and type in GM whatever, and it will bring up the help page for you. I find to be a little bit more useful because ggplot is a visualization um, tool to go to the ggplot tidyverse page. And on this page, what you'll see is in the top corner, you see the word that says reference. If you click on that, it has all of these um, functions listed. And you can click on one of your geoms, and it will give you not just help code, but the outcome of that code. So it'll show you the plot that it makes. Um, so I find that particularly helpful. OK, so the next question, what does this code do? Let's start simply. What's different about this code from the previous ones you've seen? There's multiple geometric functions. Exactly. It does. It has multiple geoms. So what do we think? This is one of the not so intuitive ones. What do we think geom jitter does? This isn't intuitive at all. So it makes a scatter plot, except it makes sure that none of the points are overlapping. So it jitters them, so they're all in their own space. But if I'm making two plots at once, how do you think R handles that? What's that? They stack on top, so like on the same plot or side by side? What do you mean? Like yeah. So um, we'll go ahead and take a look at what these two do on their own. So this is the geom box plot you've already made. This is what geom jitter looks like. So this is the same thing as the geom point, except now we've spread out our data points. So you can now have a much better idea of what your data looks like there compared to the geom point. Now, if we run these two things together, what you get is this. And it's just as you said, it overlays a box plot on top of your jitter plot. So this can sometimes be useful. Let's say you have a scatter plot and you want to overlay a trend line. That's going to be another geometric function that you add on top of your um, plot. 
A note is I believe if you mix these up and put the Geom box plot first and then the Geom jitter, it will plot the box plot first and then the jitter on top of it, and you will not see the box plot. So just be aware um, that order matters in this case. OK, so now we have these plots where we have our data on the plot, but it's not very aesthetically pleasing, and we don't have a lot of information other than the spread of our data. So we can use some other aesthetics to bring out more specific parts of um, information. So we do this using aesthetics. So another quote is, the greatest value of a picture is when it forces us to notice what we never expected to see. And this is where the power of aesthetics come in. We can use aesthetics to point the viewer's eye to certain information that we want them to gather and make sure that they get it. So for this graph that we made previously, um, where we, oh, sorry, did we make this one previously? Um, I honestly can't remember. I'm sorry. <laughs> so in this graph here, we've taken the Unipot region data set that, um, that you loaded at the beginning of class. And we um, mapped the log of the gene length versus the log of the protein length. So there's a side note here. You can do the log of your um, variable within the aesthetics. So here you see, for the most part, gene length and protein length correlate. But we have a few things that are relatively short genes that make relatively large proteins. So what if we wanted to highlight what those things are? We can use different aesthetics. So, um, so some of the things we can change include the shape. So the default for a lot of these is a circle. We can change the shape to things like triangles, squares, plus signs. There are a number of shapes available to you. We can change the size of these objects. And we can also change the color. Um, so here is a list of aesthetics that you can change including color, size, shape, alpha, and fill. So one important note. If you go to change the color of your data and the color doesn't change in the output, it's probably because you need to change the fill, not the color. Because often with some of these geoms, the color is the outline of the shape, not the fill color of the shape. So just a point. If you go to change the color and you're very confused as to why it's still black, go ahead and try changing the fill. So for our third exercise, what I want you to do is I believe you have a chunk of code. Just add aesthetics to it. Play with it. Experiment. Change different aesthetics for different variables. Um, for the data set you have, you can change aesthetics, for example, for the cell region. So if you want to see what um, variables you have available to you in the data set, you can do the, use the glimpse function or the head function, um, and then set aesthetics to those. So I'll give you a few minutes. Let's go ahead and um, talk about some of the things we could change. For those of you who are playing with it, you may have noticed that um, ggplot handles different variables in different ways. So, um, so here we're going to talk about a little bit about the difference between discrete versus continuous variables when you change these aesthetics. So for color, if you have a discrete variable, um, or a categorical variable, what it's going to do is assign each one its own color. But if you have a continuous variable, for example, if it was numeric and it's continuous, it's going to assign a scale. Um, the same is true for size. This does not count for shape. You can only uh, change shape for discrete variables. So there's one more aesthetic you may or may not have played with that um, was in the previous slide but it's not very obvious what it is. So, does, um, so this is just an example of what you might have done during the exercise. So here I changed the color of the cell region. You can see that now I have a very colorful plot. But I can also change um, alpha. Does anybody have any idea what alpha would change? Yes, it's going to change the transparency of your dot. And um, this is important because if you have a lot of data on a plot, and there's a lot of data on top of each other, you may not get a good idea of where all the points are. So go ahead and try changing the alpha in this. And you'll notice that before I had it as alpha change for cell region, I did that partly for the 
the simplicity of the slide. It does work. ggplot will ask you if you actually want to do that <laughs> because it will assign a different alpha value to each variable, but it's not the prettiest looking thing. So we usually set alpha as a number. So here you're going to set it as 0.5. Okay. So your plot should look something like this. So you'll notice that your colors don't look nearly as aggressive on this. And you can, if you look closely, especially on these outer edges, you can see other points through um, the points on top of them. Um, this is often good for plots like this, where you have just a lot of data in one area. So can anyone tell me why this chunk of code doesn't work? Yes. So in this case, the fill cell region is outside of the aesthetic, which means ggplot will not, will give you an error. So before we move on, I want to talk just for a moment about color. These colors are very bright and very obnoxious. These may not be the colors you want to use. Um, and that would be perfectly fine because color can be a very powerful tool for you, but you should also think very carefully about how you use it. This here is a schematic of one color scheme. Up at the top is default, what it looks like to someone who has normal eyesight. These are three different types of color blindness and what that same color scheme looks like to those people. So you should be aware of what your colors might look like. Often, less is more. So maybe one or two colors versus six. Um, and remember your colorblind pairs, the obvious being red and green. So um, along with that, you should consider installing the Viridis package. It's colorblind friendly continuous color scales. So if you want to make heat maps, or anything like that, where you use a continuous color scale. This is a really good package. It has one default color scale, but it has multiple color scales within it. And then um, finally, when you have a few colors on your graph, make sure they are distinct colors. If you are plotting something in red, don't make the next variable orange. If those are going to be the only two colors you have, that's not going to be very easy to distinguish. So for example, blue might be better against red than orange. So that is my personal note on color. So let's talk about global versus local. So in ggplot, I've told you so far that you can map your aesthetics within your geometric layer. But you can also map them in your ggplot function. So here we have our data, and we have our aesthetics mapped in the ggplot function rather than in our layers. And you'll see it produces the same graph it produced before when you map them in each layer individually. And this is setting your aesthetics globally. So what that means is when you set it in the ggplot function, every layer underneath of that will inherit those mappings. You may come across a case where you've added a layer that doesn't inherit that because it requires a different mapping. So let's say you have something that requires just an X mapping, not just R. Um, instead of x and y, you would then have to, um, to tell it what you want it to map. But often, ggplot will give you an error and say it needs that map. So that's mapped globally. We can then go on to map individual um, um, aesthetics within different layers. So here, we have our geom jitter like before. But let's say we wanted our box plots to be colored. Here we can set the color within the box plot, and it will only set it to the box plot layer, not to the jitter layer. So this is mapping locally, not globally. Finally, we can even map data locally. So here, if you run, there's a chunk of code that will produce an object called large protein. And um, if you run that, and then you run this code, what you would get is we've set our data to filter the proteins that are largest. And we want to label them, because this is a label um, geometric function, so geom label. 
and we want to set the label as gene name. I did not set the x and y variables in this because they are the same as the ggplot function. So here, you can see it's added labels to the top of our graph for the largest proteins. So to reiterate the point, your data can also be set locally. So we have this graph, and you know now we have our data on there. We have some color. We have some labels. But when we look at it, there's still some things that could be better. Our labels for our x and y axis are still the default of how our uh, variables are written in our data set. And for this particular graph, we don't necessarily need this legend. So let's talk about our labels and legends. Um, so once again, we have this x-axis that is cell dot region. But what if I wanted it to be a better label than that? I can use the labs function here and set my x equals to cellular compartment. So looking at this particular line, what's different about x equals cellular compartment than everything before it? It's in quotes because it's a character string. So this is, we are telling it to put this text in our label. Whereas before, we were giving it a variable from our data set. So you can see that that adds, it changes our x-axis label to cellular compartment. Apparently, I have a slide turn. Um, another thing I mentioned is that we could probably get rid of this um, legend for that particular graph because it's pretty obvious that we've colored each of these compartments individually. And I just want to show you this, where I've added guides fill none to bring home the point that every feature of your graph is customizable. We could have moved that legend to the other side or to the bottom. You could even overlay it on your plot somewhere if you really wanted to. But this is just a point that if there is something on your plot that you want to change, you can find out how to change it. So, for exercise five, what I want you to do is take this plot code and add X and Y axis labels as well as a title. So go ahead and get started on that. Anybody having any trouble finding how to set any of these titles? We all set titles? Okay, great. So you should have ended up with something that looks like this. So labs equals x equals whatever name you gave x, y equals the name of your um, axis, and then finally title is, for me, the lengths of proteins found in different cellular compartments. You can also add subtitles. You could, if you wanted to keep your legend, you can change the title of your legend, different things like this. So. Um, we're going to go on to kind of like random information now. <laughs> so in this plot, what we've done is we've mapped all of our proteins lengths for each of our compartments individually. But previously, we made a genes versus protein length, gene length versus protein length. What if we wanted to see that for each of these compartments individually? Um, so you can actually do this without plotting each one separately. So this is something called facets. So these are subplots that display the subsets of the same data. So here, what I've done is I've plotted um, gene length versus protein length. But what I've done is faceted on cell region. So this way, you can see the distribution of the data within each of these different cell regions, um, which is a little bit easier to read maybe than when we colored on cell region. So here I used facet grid rows equals the variable cell region. So in exercise six, what I want you to do is, um, does anybody have any idea what facet grid would do versus facet wrap? Anyone? No? 
Anything about the name grid versus wrap tell you anything? Okay, so no one has an answer. So let's go ahead and run the exercise. So in this exercise, there's one more thing to point out. For this, I set the ggplot function to an object. You can do this with any of your ggplot functions. You can set it to an object and then add layers individually by just saying object plus and then your um, new function. So here, you should have a facet grid function, two facet grid functions, and a facet wrap function. So go ahead and run those and get an idea of what the differences are. So everyone was able to run that? Yeah. We're going to go over that. <laughs> okay, so everyone should have had the chance to run that. And you should have gotten these three plots. So this is our first one is point tilde cell region. Um, the next one is the opposite of that, cell region tilde point, and then facet wrap. Um, so what do the point and the tilde mean? This is, I already heard one person ask. For <coughs> facets functions, the tilde is rows by columns. So um, here we said um, point, which means no split in this case. So we want it all the way across by cell region in our columns, right? Okay, so that made them vertical in this case, where our cell region name is the column name. When we did it the other way, which is rows by no split, what we have is each um, cell region is its own row, okay? And then finally, facet wrap is, we said nothing by cell region, so the, uh, what it did is created kind of a grid of your different plots. So this is probably going to be one people are more interested in, um, the facet wrap function. OK, so then we have. Let's take a moment to interject yep. something about facet. So this is going to be particularly useful during some exploratory data analysis activities. like. You have a data set and you're looking at some relationships and you're curious about you know something in this case like how long things are versus you know protein length and gene length in different departments so th this is going to be the most like common uh, facet grid is going to be used if you're um, uh, some people will use R to make final figures and so if you want your final figure whether it's for a paper or um, a, a slide for a presentation or something this is going to be um, uh, please give me my uh, data in a very specific way, right? I want all of my data sort of arranged by row or by column. This tilde operator in R is oftentimes used to indicate a formula, okay? It's, um, uh, in this case, it, you can think of it as sort of uh, hijacked to mean formula because here, dot means it's just taking everything. It's taking everything that it was given. So you're taking everything by cell region or cell region by everything. And in this case, it's just, yeah, I'm going to say I want to uh, facet wrap all my data by, you know, whatever you're interested in. So when you see the tilde in this case, you could just think by, all right. But oftentimes you'll see an R, um, and we won't get into much modeling in this course. Um, but you'll often see that this uh, this tilde is usually some sort of formula that is going to apply to some some operation. So um, that's that's really the best way to think about it. Um, and again. This is a language. You're going to be learning the language. And so we learned uh, two new elements of language today. We learned that ggplot uses a plus as part of its language. And now we know that the tilde is used for the facet part of the language. You won't see the tilde um, except in you know, very specific cases. But generally, you won't see the tilde anywhere else in uh, ggplot. Mm -hmm. I can think of one place that you might see it. But um, generally, um, that's not common part of the language, so this is very specific. Yeah. Uh, how are the facet wrap dimensions chosen? Like, does it automatically group all your data sets, or can you also specify, like, I want it to be like a three by facet grid? So question, facet underscore wrap. 
<laughs> right now. <laughs> no, uh, you can. Right? No, they, they just uh, you will see that um, if you go into the help file for facet wrap, you'll see that there are several um, uh, arguments that you can uh, supply to it. So one is you, whether or not you want um, um, uh, how many rows and how many columns. Another is these scales. And so what you can see here is that um, all of these are on the same scale, right? It all starts at 3 and goes to 15, starts at 3 and goes to 12. So um, if you now, though, have data where um, you've got this small little cluster because mitochondria are special or something, and you would say, well, I want that to be on its own axis, you can set the scales to free, and then it will automatically choose the best scale. So like these sorts of things are all within the facet um, uh, arguments. These are... I was going to say, too, for these geoms, there's so many more things you can set for these geoms. I am showing you the basic required information for a lot of these. If you go into the reference page or the help function and stuff, it will tell you all of the things you can set. I have a quick question about the data, the no splitting again. What exactly does it do? Why does it have facet wrap? So um, if you would like, you can try to take out the period mm -hmm. and do a facet grid and see what happens. Well, I tried facet wrap with and without the period, and I couldn't tell the difference. So facet wrap is going to, um, essentially the way that you can think about it, it's going to facet um, all of your graphs based on a variable in your data frame. Okay, so it will split out your data by whatever you tell it to split, and it will just wrap those all together. Okay. So that's what, what facet wrap is about. So really you're giving it one specific variable to facet on. In the, face of, in the uh, setting of facet grid, it is going to be looking for a two-dimensional grid, so it needs to know uh, what I put in each direction. Okay. Now, if you put two different things, um, or two different variables, one being cell region and one being some other variable, it will then facet on two variables in this case. So that's actually the real power of facet grid, is you can facet on more than one variable. So like if you had another variable that was like big, small, let's just say, right? And it was like some threshold, and so um, you could then uh, separate cell region, and you could se and, you know, separate again by big versus small, then what it would look like, I'll just draw it on the board here. You know, what it would look like is something like this, where you would have, you know, this would be, um, you know, big, small, and then this would be your different regions, right? And you would have basically five different. So instead of having a one by five or a five by one, in this case, you would have two by five because you would have, uh, you know, like big by cell dot region, something like that. So that's the power of facet grid. That's the real sort of reason that it was designed. In this case, we could just take advantage of, we can stack in a row or a column. Mm -hmm. But facet grid then is going to be looking for, well, what's the other thing, right? So what's the other thing? And if you don't have anything here, right, because you just want to do this, then what you do is you just give it a dot. And a dot is the way to say, I'm just going to give you everything, OK? So if you don't put something, you'll probably get an error that says, did you forget to define, or did you forget to tell me what my other uh, uh, variable to facet on is? Or it might not be that smart, it'll just say, error. Okay? Other questions? Okay. So, um, other customizable parts of your plots include your themes. So, I'm just going to give you a couple of examples here where I have the default ggplot theme, but I changed it to black and white by adding the function theme underscore bw. And that gives me this plot. Okay? And there are a number of different themes you can use. This isn't the prettiest example, but for example, this is the dark theme. And if you want to know what kind of themes are available to you, you can um, search for this on, you can Google it, different ggplot themes. I usually have to to remember which one I like. They will often give you examples. I think there's a minimal theme, a black and white theme, and there's a few others. So finally, you have this graph, and you have 
um, let's say you are like really happy with the graph you have and you want to save it. So that's really important, right? So we now want to save our plots. So there's the user interface method where you just right click on your plot and you save your image as, but there is a way to do this within your code. So we can use the ggsave function. So you can use this outside of um, the ggplot function. So you don't have to say plus ggsave. You could make it its own line of code if you wanted. It will automatically assume you want to save the last plot. You could write plot equals last plot, but it's going to automatically um, use that as the default. You can save it as a number of different types of file formats. So PDFs, PNGs, TIFFs, I believe you can do JPEGs on all of this. So um, you're just going to put the file name you want it to save it as in quotes. Okay. And finally, if you want to make a plot of specific dimensions, you can set those dimensions within your GG save. So you could say you want the width to be six or height to be six inches. So this is useful when you're making um, plots for, let's say you want to make it for a poster and you would like to not have to scale it up and down in your, um, in your software. So then the question is, where does it save it? Does anybody have an idea where it might put it automatically? Yeah, so it's going to put it right next to where your RMD file that you created it from is. So wherever your RMD file is, it, the ggplot um, is going to show up right next to it. Okay, so with that, um, just a reminder, in your cheat sheet, at the beginning of the cheat sheet, there is this little section of the ggplot2 template. This includes the the required information and a lot of things you can change. And just remember, there's a lot of things you can change that are available to you. Just simple examples on this cheat sheet, but also on the reference page. So if you want to know um, how can I change my legend or how can I change the colors of my dots, this is a good place to start. Um, so with that, there are two available homeworks. It might have a slightly different name, but it should be ggplot to homework and homework two, you can work through these. These are going to be simple examples of plots, but I want you to get used to making a plot at least once from scratch and get used to copying and pasting that to modify it. So you can work through these and we'll help you with any questions that you have. And one thing we didn't go over today, but maybe I'll have Akshay post his example of it is, you can use the plier functions within your ggplot. So let's say you wanted to color only a specific region. You can use a filter function to color only that region. Um, you can also use a filter function on your data to plot specific data. So um, we'll post an example of that in the help on the Slack. All right, thank you, Alex. One thing before you dive into the homework, you guys just pay attention for one second. So I want everybody to type a function into their console right now called git working directory. G E T W D in the parentheses because this is a function. So if you have a console open, uh, type that in. Okay, that should give you the working directory of the project that you're you're working in right now. That's where all of your information is going to save. That's where your R and D file is. So G E T W D W D is for working directory. Underscore. Underscore. I think so. The working directory. Yeah. G E T W D. Yeah. So this will um. Tell you where your working directory is, and that's where all your files are going to go, right? Oh, it works both ways. So if you lose a file, right, that's a good place to look. Okay. So the second thing, then again, just taking a step back. Okay, big picture stuff here. So um, you guys are now all ggplot gurus. Okay, <laughs> welcome to the club, right? And you know where to find all of the information, right? That's really what's going to um, be the most help here. Um, now I want. So today's Monday. So a week from today. You guys will do the previously unthinkable, which is give a two to three minute presentation in front of the class, presenting your code and presenting a visualization of the data of the insight that you gleaned from your exploratory data analysis activities. Right. So you have a week now to start thinking about like looking at the data. There's a reason that we're giving you the same data um, frames over and over and over again because we want to. Um, uh, give you guys the tools and give you guys um, the, 
the, the data sets that will allow you to, to, to uh, explore and to find something within it. We also, and this is now looking ahead, on Friday of this week, we will also give you some new data frames, some new data sets that you can explore, because then essentially you'll have the weekend to put everything together. Now, I'll reiterate what I said one other time, which is all of the exercises and all of the homeworks along the way are designed to give you the tools and to give you the code so that you can then take either one of the data sets that you've seen or one of the new data sets on Friday and apply it to that, right? So all of the things that you're typing out right now, that's your code or cut and paste, that's the collective our code. And the nice thing about this uh, community, this sort of, sort of data science activity and this R community is everybody shares everything. So yes, while Ali might have typed up and given you guys the code for the assignments today, you can take that code and put it into the homework assignments right now, and it's a balance. Some people say, you need to type this out so it gets ingrained into your fingers. Well, I can tell you that I've typed this out several times, and I still have to Google every single time I'm trying to uh, figure out how to do something. Okay, so a combination of typing and copying and pasting and going to Google and all of these things, like this is, this is the activity, this is the way um, to do it. So um, I just want to take that moment now and remind you that a week from today, this is the hope, this is the goal, is for you guys to present something to us. And today was a big step, right? Because uh, Wednesday was the intro, right? That was the fire hose day, welcome to R. Uh, then we have Friday, which is the flyer, the verbs that we use to mutate, to generate new data, to make comparisons, and so on. And really, ggplot it, is it, right? So we have new data that we made with the flyer, and then we visualize it. And then, based on the visual, because we did some exploratory data analysis, because we faceted it and saw that there was an outlier, then what we can do is we can go back and we can make a new variable using some mutate functions, and then put that back into ggplot. And now we have some more information, and this is what Ali was saying, that option will post some code, where you can add another layer of information. So we've got this you know, sort of base information, a scatter plot, there's 20,000 points. Honestly, that's not that useful or that you know, intuitive or insightful. But then if we color code it, we say, wow, well the color for all of the, whatever, ER proteins are all together, whereas everything else is completely random. Well, that, that could be meaningful. It's at least interesting and worth exploring. That's where we're going. That's what we're trying to do. So we have a little extra time today. We have two different homework assignments. And the idea is with the exercise in class, there was a lot of what we call scaffolding. So there was a lot of code that was uh, typed out for you. You just hit, hit run. Or you take that code, you paste it below, you change one variable, you hit run. So you'll see in the homework assignments, there's a little bit less and a little bit less. So refer back to the R markdown files in order to carry this out. So if you have questions, raise your hand, shout out. We'll um, be around for the next little while to help you. If you uh, have a copy date or something, you can go ahead and take off, it's up to you. So on Wednesday, we will have um, Akshay and Ali will both lecture um, on two different topics. Again, a little bit um, a more advanced uh, type information. Uh, Friday, we've got our markdown files, and then Monday is, uh, is you guys. Thank you. All right, that wraps up Tidy Biology for today. Thank you for watching. And if you have any comments, go ahead, put them below. If you like us, give us a thumbs up. If you want to see more of this, go ahead, hit the subscribe, and you'll see all of the videos that we post about Tidy Biology. Thanks, see you again.